welcome to chapter 14, The World Discovers Wimbe. Despite the incident with the famine, my popularity as an inventor led to other opportunities. That same year, one of the teachers at Wimbe Primary asked if I'd be interested in starting a science club for the students. He was impressed by my windmill and wanted one on campus. The students look up to you, he said. Your skills in science will really challenge their brains. Sure, I said, I'll do it. The windmill I created for the school was small, much like my first radio experiment. For the blades, I used a metal maze pail, and the generator was a radio motor. I attached it to a blue gum pole and ran the wires into my old Pasonic tube battery radio. I did this during recess one morning when all the kids were playing soccer. When I connected the wires and music blasted through the schoolyard, a small riot erupted from all the excitement. The windmill not only allowed students to listen to music and news, but they could also charge their parents' mobile phones. Each Monday, I explained to them the basics of science and gave some popular examples of simple innovation like how ink was first made by using charcoal. I also demonstrated the cup and string experiment featured in my books to help explain how a telephone works. I later found out that some of the students had been so inspired by the windmill, they'd gone home and made toy versions themselves. I imagine what it would be like if all those pin pinwheels were real. What if every home and shop in Wimbe had machines on the rooftops to catch the wind? At night, the entire valley would sparkle like a clear sky full of stars. Bringing electricity to my people no longer seemed like a madman's dream. In early November 2006, some officials from the Malawi Teacher Training Activity were inspecting the library at Wimbe Primary when they noticed my windmill in the schoolyard. They asked Ms. Sakello who'd built it and gave them my name. One of, my, one of them telephoned his boss, Dr. Hartford Machisma, and described what he'd seen. A few days later, Dr. Machisma drove five hours to Wimbe. He was even more amazed once he saw the larger windmill at my house, and he asked my father if he could speak with the boy who built it. He's here, my father said, and called me from my room. Dr. McKeesme was an older man with gray hair and kind, patient eyes. But when he spoke, his command of language was large and powerful. I'd never heard anyone speak such good Chichua, and when he spoke English, it was simply eloquent. He asked me about the windmill and how it came about. Tell me everything, he said. I told a story as I'd done a hundred times before, then took him through the house, demonstrating how my switches and the circuit breaker worked. He listened carefully, nodding his head and asking specific questions. These are very tiny bulbs. Why aren't you using big ones? I can use big ones, I said, but light, big lights require more voltage. The dynamo is only so strong. How far did you go with your education? Just the first year in secondary school. Then how did you know this stuff about voltage and power? I've been borrowing books from the library. Who teaches you this stuff? Who helps you? No one, I said. I've been reading and doing it alone. Dr. Machismo went, then went to my parents. You have lights in your house because of your son, he said. What do you think of this? We thought he was mad, my mother said. Dr. Machismo laughed and shook his head. I want to tell you something, he said. You may not realize, but your son has done an amazing thing, and this is only the beginning. You're going to see a lot more people come here to see William Kakawamba. I have a feeling this boy will go far. I want you to be ready. The visit left me a little confused and very excited. No one had ever asked me such questions before, and no one had taken that kind of interest. That afternoon, Dr. Machisme returned to his office in Zomba and told his colleagues what he'd seen. This is fantastic, they said. The whole world needs to know about this boy. I agree, said Dr. Machisma, and I have just the idea. The next week, Dr. Machisma returned to my house with a journalist from Radio 1. It was the famous Everson Masea, whose voice I'd heard for years. He'd come to my house to interview me. What do you call this thing, he asked. I'm calling it electric wind. But how does it work? The blades spin and generate power from a dynamo. And in the future, what do you want to do with this? I want to reach every village in Malawi so people can have lights and water. While we waited for the Radio 1 interview to air, Dr. Machisme came with even more reporters. These men represented all the great media organizations in Malawi. Mudzuwithu and Zodiac radio channels, the Daily Times, the Nation, and Malawi News. They poured out of the car with their cameras and tape recorders and flocked around the windmill. For two hours, they moved through the house, elbowing and shoving one another to get the best pictures of my switches and battery system. You've had your turn. Now it's my turn. Move aside. My paper is bigger. Soon, our yard was filled with crowds from Trading Center who'd come to gawk at the famous journalists. Look, it's Noel Macumba from Zodiac, they'd say. Finally, we see his face. What a handsome man. And he's interviewing William. One of the reporters even climbed my tower and studied the blades and chain system, taking pictures the whole time. Machisme, this chap is a genius, he shouted. Yes, he answered. And this is the problem with our system. We're losing talent like this all the time as a result of poverty. And when we do send them back to school, it's not a good education. 
I'm bringing you here because I want the world to see what this boy has done, and I want them to help. Like me, Dr. Machisme's father had also been a poor farmer who struggled to feed and clothe his family, but he knew the value of an education. At one point when Dr. Machisme was young, he had volunteered to drop out of school and work so his brothers could go instead. His father refused, saying, All of my kids will stay in school. I'll do whatever it takes. It took nearly ten years for Dr. Machisme to complete his secondary education. He later earned degrees from universities in Malawi, America, Britain, and South Africa. Before working for the M -Tem MTTA, he'd written many Malawian textbooks, including my own Standard 8 English reader. That afternoon, I took the paper to the trading center to show everyone what the madman had done. We also heard you on the radio, they said. We're so impressed of how well you spoke. In a way, it took having these reporters come to my house to make our town finally accept my windmill. After the media coverage, the number of visitors to my house increased tenfold. Shortly after, I started some much-needed improvements on the windmill. I realized the big mango tree behind the latrine was blocking my strongest wind, and I needed to go higher. My father, with the Daily Times story under his arm, was able to convince the manager of the tobacco estate to give me several giant poles, which I used to build a tower that was 36 feet high. Once I moved it away from the mango tree, the speed of my blades doubled, and so did the voltage. The day after the Daily Times article ran, a Malawian in a long way named Soyapi Mumba brought the article to his office. So Yapi worked as a software engineer and coder at Baobab Health Partnership, an American charity organization that was working to computerize Malawi's healthcare system. One of Soyapi's colleagues, a tall American man named Mike McKay, liked the article about my windmill so much that he wrote about me on his blog, Hacktivate. That blog entry caught the attention of Amika Okafor, a famous Nigerian author and blogger who also, who was also the program director with something called the TED Global Conference. Well, Amika wanted me to apply to be an official fellow at his, this conference, and for three weeks tried very hard to find me. After harassing the reporters at the paper every day, he finally tracked down Dr. Machisme. In mid-December 2006, Dr. Machisme came to my home with the application and paperwork for TED. We sat down under the mango tree, and he helped me answer a list of questions, plus write a small essay about my life. When he left, I still had no idea what TED was, though I do know it means technology, entertainment, and design and it's an annual meeting where scientists and innovators get together and share their big ideas. I wasn't entirely sure what a conference was or what people did at such things. The application didn't even say where it was held. I suspected a long way the capital, but didn't know. I imagined myself walking those busy streets and seeing all sorts of new people. I wondered what clothes I would need to wear, since everything I owned hung from a rope in my bedroom and was covered in red roof dust. Even still, it gave me, some, it gave me something to dream about. The following week, Dr. Machisme called to say that Ted had chosen me. The conference would be held in Arusha, Tanzania, an entirely different country. You'll be honored with other scientists and inventors, he said. People from all over the world will be there. Perhaps something good can come from it. Wow, Arusha. How long would that bus ride take, and what if I got hungry? I'd have to bring plenty of food, perhaps cakes and roasted maize. After all, I had no money. One important thing, he said. We should book your flight before it fills up. I'm traveling by plane? My God. Yes, and they wish to know if you want a smoking or non-smoking room, room in the hotel. I'm staying at a hotel? I thought for sure I'd be sleeping in one of those guest house, houses near the boozing dens where poor people stay. Of course you're staying in a hotel, he said. And I have other good news, William. You're going back to school. After visiting my house with the reporters, Dr. Machise may approach the government about accepting me into a school. He'd even taken a collection among his colleagues to help pay for my first semester. The process had taken months. Finally, the Ministry of Education had granted me permission to attend Madisi Secondary, a public boarding school an hour from my home. It wasn't one of the science-based schools I'd longed to attend. The headmasters at those places weren't willing to accept me on account of my old age and number of years I'd been a dropout. However, the headmaster of Medici, Mr. Ronix Vanda, was so moved by my story that he offered to spend the extra time with me helping me catch up. I was terribly behind. While Dr. Machise made plan my trip to Arusha, I packed my things and went to school. This was the first time I'd ever lived away from home. In my suitcase, I packed a toothbrush and toothpaste, flip-flops, a blanket, and all my dirt streaked clothes. I carried it through the courtyard and stopped under the mango tree where Jeffrey and my parents were waiting. I guess I'll see you soon, I told them. Work hard, my father said. I want to know you I want you to know we're very proud. Jeffrey strapped my suitcase to his bicycle, and we rolled it toward the truck stop. Along the way, I said goodbye to Gilbert. We don't have phones, so how will we talk, he asked. It will be difficult, I said. 
Maybe I can come visit you there. Oh, Gilbert, that would be great. Please do. I'll miss you, friend. For sure. A pickup soon appeared in a cloud of dust. Geoffrey waved his hands and hand and flagged down the driver. I'll see you when school ends, he said. When you arrive, find someone with a phone and send me their number. We'll talk this way. I'll make sure Gilbert is there. That would be good, he said. I said. Take care of my windmill, will you? Let me know everything that happens. Sure, sure, don't worry. I climbed aboard with the other passengers, found a sack of charcoal for a seat, and we rolled toward Kasungu. Once there, I caught a minibus down the M1 highway to the small town of Medici. The minibus dropped me at a junction on the outskirts of town, where a long road led to the school. The classrooms in Medici had solid roofs that didn't leak in smooth, unblemished concrete floors. Large windows let in the sunshine but kept out the cold. I had an actual desk of my own, complete with pencil holder. During study sessions at night, real fluorescent lights buzzed overhead, or at least they did when there wasn't a blackout. Science class was held in an actual chemistry lab, where the shelves were lined with microscopes, giant coils of high-resistant wire, glass breakers, and old jars of boric acid. Boric acid. If you can believe it, one of the first lessons in science class was how current passes through an electric bell. I'd already applied this concept with my windmill, and in English, it was like hearing it for the first time. But like every other school in Malawi, Medici relied on the government to survive. Unlike some of the more prestigious boarding schools, it had been forgotten. Most of the equipment in the science lab was old and no longer worked. If any, anyone has an extra one in their rooms, I'm happy to demonstrate, the teacher said. No one did, so we used our imaginations. Our dorms were also dirty and the walls were covered with graffiti. The urinals in the bathroom didn't work, so the new students had to clean them every day to keep down the smell. The rooms themselves were so cramped that each we each had to share our bed with another boy. My bed name was my bedmate was a guy named Kennedy who never cleaned his socks. Hey man, you need to wash your feet before you come to bed with me, I told him. Sorry, I can't ever tell. I'll wash tomorrow, promise. But he never did. Often I'd wake up with his feet touching my mouth. And because I was years older than everyone else, some of the students teased me. They shouted, How many kids did you leave behind the farm, old man? Two boys and one more in the way, perhaps next month. He thinks he's funny, they said. He's spending too much time with his cows. One day I decided to end the teasing once and for all. I pulled out the newspaper article about my windmill and slapped it down the table. Here, this is what I was doing. Good job, man, they said. No one teased me after that. While I attended school at Medici, Dr. Machisme was busy making arrangements for Arusha. He helped me get a passport and even took a collection for a new white shirt and black trousers. They were the nicest clothes I'd ever owned. He also gave me useful travel advice. For instance, on a plane, I'd be assigned a seat that was mine and mine only. There was no need to rush and use your elbows like people did on Malawian buses. Also, if the red light was on near the bathroom, that meant it was occupied, and because some passengers become nauseous on their first plane ride, each seat came with a paper bag for vomit. This was good information because I was certain I'd need it. In June, I left school and came home to pack. The next morning, a driver appeared to take me to the airport in the long way. Our son is leaving us and traveling by airplane, my father said. That's right, flying like a bird in the sky. I'll be waving as I pass over. We'll be watching for you. You'll see us here. My father then tucked a bag of roasted peanuts in my pocket. They were still warm. On the plane, I couldn't believe it, but sitting next to me was none other than Soyapa Mumba, the software engineer from the long way who'd first seen my article. Because he's a nice guy, he introduced himself, not knowing who I was. Then I told him my name and where I was going. He replied, oh my god, William the Windmill Guy? He explained how excited he was to show the story to Mike McKay, who'd blogged about me on Hacktivate. So Yappy was the very reason anybody had ever heard about me, and now here he was sitting next to me on the plane. It also happened that Soyapi was a TED fellow himself, being honored for his coding work with Baobab. I was so fortunate to find him. As the plane taxied toward the runway, I began to notice the others seated around me. They looked so well-dressed and confident, like they had important things to do, and their busy lives required them to travel in jets across the world. As the plane accelerated and lifted its nose in the air, I pressed my head back against the seat and laughed. I was now one of them, too. And that's where chapter 14 ends. We have one more chapter left of our story, chapter 15, and you'll finish listening to parts one and two this week as we wrap up our story.